welcome, welcome everyone and welcome the, the new joiners. Um, I'm Daniel, part of, part of Arendelle here with a few colleagues and uh, a few other people who have joined us today. Uh, very excited for a conversation with Thomas, who I've known for now uh, quite a few years. Uh, we, met, uh, we met a while ago in, in Ibiza when this crazy millionaire had decided to bring a collection of thinkers together to talk about the future. And, and Thomas had some fantastic insights uh, about network dynamics and also related about mating behavior and, and a bunch of other things very related to how our social lives have evolved. So I, uh, I, I kept in touch. Uh, we, we have conversed from time to time over the years. And more recently, when we started a research project around community health, Thomas research and thinking definitely came to mind uh, as, as someone who has really fantastic ideas in this space. Uh, and I thought it would be great to invite him to share some of his work with the, with the Arendelle crowd and, and part of our community. Um, so Thomas, over to you, if you'd like to give a, a bit more of an, an introduction, share, uh, share about you and, and the floor is yours. Sure, thank you. Can I ask that everybody puts their video on please? It's very disconcerting to talk to some empty pictures. Thank you. Great. Uh, I presume those who are not putting on are just not here. Uh, Hi. Hi. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, I'm just um, in the uh, middle of stuff, <laughs> the stuff, but I can hear you fine. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah but no, the question is not whether you can hear me. The question is whether I can see you. Great, thank you. And I presume those who didn't put it on are not here. Um, it's just very, you know, we are learning. We are learning how to communicate with each other. And I think step one is that we keep our faces available for the others when uh, they are having a conversation with us. Uh, in the human, a human doesn't come alone. A human comes in the community. And step one is that we provide the basic inputs to to the others to uh, engage with us, or we can't uh, engage. Uh, so Daniel asked me to talk. I'm Tamash David Barrett. I'm a behavioral scientist. Daniel asked me, uh, off, offered you my entire set of research, uh, which last year I did a 24-hour lecture, which was sort of the abstract of my research. It was very difficult to cover it all. So maybe I thought that we could do that. I'll tell you a little bit about what I do and maybe some initial thoughts, and then we could have a conversation. Uh, and I, maybe I can pull up some, some graphs or some data or, uh, from my own research, if it's interesting uh, for you. So um, what I work on is the evolutionary origins of network building uh, behavior in our species. So we are an ape species. And we form, uh, we exist in networks. Every human society uh, is uh, automatically switching to networks. Uh, we, we structure ourselves into networks. And it is quite interesting because uh, the, the structure of the network, which was very long time was not um, uh, researched, is actually essential to the health of the community. Uh, about uh, 35 years ago, um, uh, some researchers, maybe you know Robin Dunbar's name, uh, Dunbar's number, uh, observed that uh, we have sort of a similarish number of social connections to each other. And uh, the way I imagine, I used to, you know, for, for five years, I, I shared a, a room with Robin, so I know quite intimately uh, uh, his thoughts, and, and, and we actually did the mathematical model of all of this together. And, and the way I think about this, or thought about it at the time, is that almost as if all of us have a shelf, a shelf for other humans. And, and when we are, we don't have enough books on the shelves, we, we don't have other, enough others on the shelves, we feel a little lonely and we go out into the pub and start randomly, weirdly chatting to someone. And then we have too many, then we have to take out a book and then 
then that's how we put in a, a new person in. So it's sort of a bit like that with, with other humans, that we have this shelf of humans. And, and the reason that there is this shelf, because it takes ages to maintain contact, real meaningful contact with each other. Uh, and all of that is, we actually inherited. So if you, for instance, engage with my eyes, let me bring the camera a little closer, and just simply look at my eyes on the screen. And then we all know this, yeah, within a few seconds, we start having some kind of feelings, yeah? Those feelings are neuropeptides, uh, social neuropeptides running on our brain. Um, uh, all of this is an inherited behavior. Uh, and we share it <laughs> with other apes and other primates. Um, so these facilitated then to engage with this context. So that was Robbins and, and some others, original contribution to science. But what they sort of missed out a little bit on was the structure among these books on the shelf, among these humans on the shelf. Uh, and it turns out that structure is very important. Um, the way I got to this was realizing how different a family is compared to friends. So if you imagine that you have, uh, let's say I have two brothers, Pete and Jack. So my relationship is with Pete is because we are brothers, it's going to long lasting and will be there for sure. It's a hundred percent probability that the relationship is there and it will last for our lives because we are brothers. And with Pete, I will have exactly the same kind of long lasting stable relationship. But in a family, a curious things happen, happens, which is sort of trivial again, because they are my brothers, they too will be connected to each other. So in network language, we will have a closed triangle. If you have two friends, uh, Julian and Robert, Julian might be my friend, but it might not last forever. So uh, less than 100% probable, it's gonna last a little bit on more unstable edge. And what was the other, Robert? Uh, uh, the same thing, but they are more likely than random to be connected to each other, but definitely not 100%. So very interesting that this, this is generally true for, for relatives, for cousins as well, not as strongly as, as with, with friends. So the first realization was that, gee, when we have family networks or large families, they are going to be much more interconnected. So suddenly it's, it's not only that how many social connections we have, it's not, that's not the only thing that matters. What also matters is whether they are connected to each other. And in traditional large families, especially in rural spaces where uh, people wouldn't move away, so high fertility, rural, non-migratory societies, we would be given a, a group of people in which we would, the interconnectedness would be very high. We would feel comfortable. And then there would be a change to a society. In this change, we would have fewer kids. So about in 1960, uh, so 60 years ago, the first time where we actually measured the number of kids for a species, all of them, we had about 5.2 children per woman for the entire species. Today it is 2.5 turning 2.4. And with that, the number of social contexts with whom we can have a, a family group collapsed. So we are replacing people, those social connections with our friends. So one example is just to think about if you were to organize a, a big uh, event in which, in which you had to, in which you had to uh, organize some kind of, let's say, a construction in a village. And in a traditional society, you would invite all the people in the same generation as you are. So you would invite, imagine that you invited your, 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 your siblings and your first degree cousins and their partners, and the same thing for your, your own partner's side. Yeah. So you would be cooking for that evening for 178 people. All of them, same generation as you. 
all of them um, siblings or cousins and their partners and your partner's partner, 178 people. So you have a lot of space to fill up your social network, you know, that those shelves, you would have a lot of people to put in there. When you go have a society of two children, in Europe, the average is about 1.6 today, two children, you're only cooking for 22 people. When you have a society for one child per woman, South Korea is already under one and every society is going down. Then it's only two people you're cooking for, you and your partner. There's no, there are no relatives, zero. So this way, when we are moving from a high fertility society towards a low fertility society, and we have a very similar effect with urbanization, and we have a very similar effect with migration, and actually with mortal epidemics and warfare. You know, two years ago, uh, when I when I gave this the, these examples, I, I wouldn't have to add the mortal epidemics and war, warfare, but uh, suddenly both of them are unfortunately back on the agenda. Uh, so these have a very similar effect. We, we get, we lose our, our family network. So we shift to friends. And as we shift to friends, we have uh, in network language, if you know network language, we, the clustering coefficient falls. It's a very, it's a very interesting phenomenon that happens to the society. Because it turns out that clustering co coefficient, the interconnectedness of our, of our social network is very important for us. This is something that we are born with to recognize the importance of that. And then inter what that interconnectedness does is that it allows reputation-based cooperation. Because if I know that we have 50 shared friends and oh, we just met today, I will know that you are not likely to screw me because your, our shared friends will report. I will report back to the shared friends and, and you will know the same thing about me. So I will say, hey, let's do something together and we can both feel safe. If we do not have those shared friends, suddenly the channels in which this reputation goes back, things out. And then the whole thing collapses, the collective action collapses. If you think about it, there are a lot of different solutions to this problem. Yeah, one is, uh, hey, tonight, uh, we're having a party tonight, a dinner party. There's gonna be Kate. Do you want to come over? You guys are get on like a house on fire. Yeah, uh, but I'm asking you to drop a friend, take somebody out of your bookshelf of people and Kate to take somebody off of her bookshelf of people. Uh, so, that, so my clustering coefficient goes up. Yeah? Joining a club does the same thing. Suddenly in a club, we are members of the same community. And then again, our clustering coefficient goes up. The interconnectedness goes up. Very interesting that the, that the club opening frequency in London was exactly one generation after the uh, upper middle classes fertility to started to fall in the 19th century. And incidentally, uh, the club sizes are so that they can function. They're never too big, so that they can function as a as a as a way to increase your clustering coefficient. Anyway, there's a host of different different uh, solutions to the problem. The point is that unless we find ourselves in a highly interconnected social network, we feel horrible. We feel lonely. We feel lost. A lot of urban depression is coming from this. And to this suddenly came comes a bunch of technological solutions. A bunch of technological solutions that create some kind of reputation without a meaningful human interaction. And then we start scratching our head because it sort of works, but it also makes us a little lost at the same time. Uh, some of one of the solutions is that simply adding reputation scores to people yeah uh i don't know whether you have you have uh, stayed anywhere recently where which was not via uh, airbnb 
or not via booking.com or one of these. Yeah, it was very interesting. I used to have a professorship in, in Chile and I used to commute between Oxford and Chile a lot. And I would stay off always in an Airbnb uh, place. And then suddenly somebody suggested that their friend's friend was renting out a fantastic place, which is not on Airbnb on purpose. And that was the only time I had a falling out with the, with my host. The only time when there was no reputation, no, no way to to engage with us, any kind of reputation on both sides. Uh, so anyway, so we've got a bunch of these solutions. And of course, we have we get to DAOs, where, which are, and I presume this is what Daniel's new venture is about, to figure out how to connect these two problems. The, the problem that this reputation works, we are super sensitive to the reputation of others, but at the same time, we are we are evo we evolved to be wired to build this reputation via real human interaction. In a way, what law does is also a similar thing that it sort of eliminates eliminates the reputation element, the actual cooperation element. Anyway, I don't want to go, go into that too much. But anyway, so this is what I work on. Uh, what I work on is how our societies are changing as fertility is falling, as we move into cities and we start migration and moving around all the time, which is, I presume everybody is in the, on this call have done a lot. We have, we constantly deal with new kind of people. And one of the most important, most obvious tricks is, of course, to to have some something shared with others. Because if you have something shared with others, more likely that we will also have shared social connections. So if you if you met all the uh, wine loving, Mozart loving sailors in Oxford, you are you met some of my friends. Yeah. So then, so the similarity actually signals increased. Uh, 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 interconnectedness, interclustering coefficients. Uh, uh, Susan is asking common Twitter followers. Uh, it's quite interesting how many of these these uh, 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 social networks are signaling. The first thing that will signal to you is the shared, what's shared with others, especially shared humans with others. Yeah. So if I if I somebody clicks on me on Facebook and we have more than fifty friends, I will of course accept even if I have no idea who they are. Uh, no, I won't buy alone. Yes, well, let's we will see what happens there. Uh, anyway, so this is what I work on together with uh, with some version of this, which is a mate choice, because it turns out that we take or take we when we choose a partner a long-term partner, not a short-term partner, when we choose our long-term partners, we take this into account. We take take into account of how much our cluster coefficient is going to go up if we stay with this person. Brilliant. Uh, it turns all, all across different cultures. Uh, it, it turns out that some of our current shift from patriarchy to matriarchy or gender equality is also uh, uh, interpreted can be interpreted uh, within this uh, framework and so on. Uh, cognition and knowledge systems are also dependent on, on this. So anyway, so this is what I, I, I do. And um, if if you have anything to comment or uh, even a question, uh, uh, let's let, let's open up. So what do you what do you guys think? Hi, it's just following on that from that. It's really interesting. Thanks so much. For the, um, can you hear me? Um, yeah, that's really, really interesting. And I, I love because I, I was working at an AI startup that was looking at neural networks. And so I'm familiar with these terms of like clustering and coefficient, etc. But I'm, that's not my technical background, necessarily. But I love the um, parallels, you know, between all these social relations, as you're saying, within actually how we are developing a lot of AI and machine learning uh, systems. And then but then that last comment about Twitter followers is really interesting, too. Um, because the firm I'm in at the moment would do investigative due diligence um, and we look at Twitter connections, for example, to see how people, companies are linked because that those relationships are important to track things, whether it's sanctions, whether it's, um, you know, yeah, relationships that weren't previously disclosed. And there's obviously a lot of regulatory as well as just, it, just other implications of that. But then obviously now, so Twitter can show those connections. Some connections are more... Um, uh, what do you call it, like official than others, because obviously there's a lot of people that follow someone but doesn't necessarily have a two-way connection. And that just links with all the other sort of platforms, I guess, you know, LinkedIn, social media platforms, where 
relationships are tracked or like it's able to be discovered through these technology like to, through these platforms yeah do you think that forms a danger of it getting into the, into the wrong hands or not so much because they're not necessarily truly representative of of social relationships you know because we can be connected on linkedin but then you between two connections from the outside you won't be able to tell which one's stronger than the others you won't know which one's stronger than the other you just know that it's a connection of some sort so yeah really interesting as we move into this di more digital world and lives how um yeah just where do you see this going and in, in terms of especially when it can get into the wrong hands yeah i do not i do not know uh, the answer to this i mean we had this fantastic we realized that we can tell um the relationship type from phone communication patterns the first time we figured this out was uh in the european countries uh, uh, uh phone communication network for for one year um or seven months uh and we realized that if we know everyone's age and and gender uh and simp and the phone numbers and we have access to all the phone data we can figure out who is your uh, uh, best friend who is your lover who are your parents who are your kids pretty scary and then we repeated this on an extremely large database of four years of all phone calls in a south american country um and where we even had the people's names and in that part of the world people have two double, two family names uh the first family name is the is the first family name of the of the paternal grandfather and the second family name is the first family name of the maternal grandfather and from there we were able to able to test whether what we found uh in the european data set was correct and it turns out it was the logic is not entirely of course we there were, there were a lot of uh, uh false finds but more or less from simply the communication pattern we can figure out uh who is who but of course from there we can also figure out who's gay we can also also easily see who who are the secret lovers uh surprisingly um and and at least the europe the gdpr is is protecting us in in that that american country i insisted to implement gdpr so anything that come to came to our team uh had to be between be behind a, a a gdpr war uh and people in the phone company were laughing at us because of course uh, they they did not implement any of that um and so this is a this is a uh this kind of data is a has a has a sword with two edge edgy sides yeah like uh, um we can have all kind of issues with it and um, so i do not know what the solution is some of my students argue that we should just do everything in the open and everything everybody sees every, everything and we assumed assume always assume that we do everything in the open the trouble is that we we don't have our evolved psychology is social psychology is simply not capable of processing that uh i will always ignore whatever whoever is listening to on my phone because i can't process the danger from that uh so um but you know they're super interesting course i mean we you know the the entire way of designing systems as what you what you say you're doing now is uh uh, uh or, or checking the connect interconnections as uh for due diligence is 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 a fantastically useful tool so uh jason says yeah. yeah thank you and thank you for a really interesting um, introduction to your work i have a question that builds off of Isabella's comments, I think, that um, we're, I feel like we might be having a couple of different conversations here that I'd like to bring together. And so one of them, you, you've given us a lot to think about in terms of social networks, in terms of their being interpersonal and those relationships. But Isabella brought up the example of LinkedIn, which is not necessarily interpersonal, that starts bringing work relationships in. And so given that individuals are involved in multiple kinds of networks, what do you see as the implication of that for how we're relating to each other? And I also wanted to, um, I'm thinking about this a lot just in the context of DAOs because we have a component of social network where you're buying into a value system and you're opting in, but there also there's work to be done and there's, there's token compensation for that work sometimes. And so it seems to me that they sit in between these two different kinds of networks. And so it might be fruitful to think about that interaction. 
Yeah. Um, so very interesting. Uh, what you raised, uh, I've been trying to think about it recently a little bit. Uh, in that um, law, when we cooperate with each other, because uh, the law tells us to do so, in a behavioral sense, it is not cooperation. Yeah, so when if you and I meet and let's say we have a, some kind of prisoner dilemma set up, yeah, we can we can cooperate or, or we can cheat each other. Um, and of course, the more frequently we're going to meet, we're going to be more likely to to uh, cooperate because of the repeated game element and the more co uh, higher number of connections we have, more likely to cooperate because of the reputation element. Uh, but that is given, there's entirely dependent on that, that game's payoff. What law does is changes the payoff matrix. And suddenly I'm not cooperating because I decided to cooperate in, in a behavioral sense. I'm cooperating because the pay of my payoff matrix has been changed so that it seems as if I was cooperating with you. Yeah. Uh, but it's, we just, it's almost a, a mutual, if you know, in biological terms, it's a mutualism rather than, uh, so, um, and so that is very interesting because suddenly then we exist in this forest of other humans in which we do not have an engagement in a real social engagement with these others. Uh, we, that's the moment when we, we separate, we create a distinction between a co-worker and a friend. Friend is we cooperate with a co-worker, we mutual, we do some activities in our vicinity that is essentially mutualism. It's a very interesting distinction. And I think that the, a lot of what's going on in, 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 in redesigning organizations is moving towards a space in which we are there's a space to, to create real relationships. So we sort of move away um, and we are clearly hungry for this. I mean, we feel awful when we are, we, we, as, as, you know, as apes, as human apes, we feel awful when we are surrounded by only this, this work colleague type of relationships. And, and we feel that our social life have, uh, has emptied out. And it, in fact, it has, because these are really you know, the, the forest humans and they're not the actual real relationships around us. Uh, so I wonder whether, whether when you have this really odd or multi-level and multi-type relationships with each other, that is the, that is the core of essence. But you know, this is how far I have thought so far. So if you have a solution, please tell me, because uh, right now I'm just observing that this is an issue. And I, I, I don't think I have a, I haven't, I haven't found an answer at least for, for myself, for, for what this really means. Srijan, I'm afraid Srijan, I'm not sure quite sure how to pronounce your name. It's called Srijan. It's called Srijan. Srijan, okay, great. Yeah, I had the same you... question as Jason, uh, but you know, I uh, was even thinking about, you know, so nowadays while working in DAOs or Web3 in general, uh, we come across many people who keep their identity anonymous. Uh, they use pseudonyms, which are common everywhere. And they do not even turn on their videos. Like you asked us to turn on our videos, right? So how do we, you know, build a connection with them? And how do we, you know, uh, sort of, you know, identify their reputation or what, what sort of a metric can we use, uh, you know, to build a relationship with them? I mean, we... There's a difference between being television and being an interaction. Yeah, so or a radio. Yeah, so there there are different kinds of interactions. When I do uh, TV work, I I often have somebody either somebody stand there uh, or, or I need need a human interaction. Otherwise, I can't. Uh, and I think many of us have this problem in in academia. Um, in academia, one of the one of the big traumas has been for people is that the students switch off their, their, their screens. And, and a lot of, lot of people in academia are effectively traumatized by it because they, they, are, they, have, to engage, they have to provide an, a teaching in a, in a teaching context uh, 
without any kind of feedback. Yeah. Uh, so, so I'm not quite sure whether it is possible to to have a bo a two way bonding. It is possible to do some tricks with which the other side, if they are paying attention behind a closed off uh, 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 camera and closed off uh, microphone, they they engage with you. But it is not going to be a two way. It cannot possibly be a two way connection. Uh, just the same way a television presenter cannot possibly bond with the with all those people who are watching her, uh, whereas they might bond with with her. So given the cues that the producer decided to provide, pro provide. So I'm not sure whether these come, when people are doing anonymously, it's almost like, yeah, it's like by definition uh, is playing the system, uh, playing the behavioral system. Yes, I'm talking here uh, be behavior. Um, yeah. uh, Laurie, uh, you raised your hand. Yeah. Um, you said something really interesting about um, clustering coefficient and how Nowadays, we tend to have more fragmented networks. We belong to different networks, which aren't as tight knit as they used to be, which results in us maybe feeling more lonely. I'm interested in you saying more about this because I'm not familiar with the mental health uh, connection to that because the way I look at it, when I see a high a person who belongs to multiple cluster, in the workplace, it usually means that they have higher influence, they're usually in senior positions. So I equate that to something good because usually it translates into high influence and sort of usually these people are the people you want to leverage for as a force for good. But I just observe my own personal network, which because of traveling, etc., is actually quite fragmented. And I'm quite curious as to what is the impact on mental health because, yeah, I, I'm not familiar at all with that literature. So, more insight would be lovely. Yeah, so it seems that we live uh, 10 years longer if we are in a very highly connected, uh, stable. That's when the happy human is in a, in a, healthy, is in a healthy community. Very uh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> but, but it seems that there are all kinds of coping mechanisms that we have invented. Uh, to to deal with these, you know, in the olden times, it was almost like an onion. So the the metaphor people use were, you know, there's a layers of onions. So you have a inner layer, a further out layer, and then this is how your social world works. But it clearly not. I don't think it was really true in the olden times, uh, but it's definitely not true today. So today we have more of these fragmented worlds in which we actually quite trying hard to to increase the clustering coefficient, in, increase the interconnectedness of our different fragments of social network. But it's it's tricky because one of the characteristics of these traditional uh, 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 social networks is that this is where our communal knowledge comes from. So if you think about what happens in the whole fake news phenomenon, it's a network phenomenon in which our, our drive to exist in the same truth system as our immediate social network exists uh, that is the, that drive uh, is 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 what what brings us to believe whatever they believe yeah I regularly catch myself in fake uh, following fake news you know I'm a, I, I have my identity as a heart hitting scientist yeah uh, and what happens is that that uh, you I can't really uh, engage with with uh, 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 out, outside it, yeah. So I'll give an example, yeah. So in this in this truth system, yeah. So that uh, uh, at one point, uh, I, there were a lot of people who, on my social network who thought that the Amazon is burning, uh, and it's 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 awful that the Amazon is is burning, yeah. Uh, and I thought, oh, okay, uh, uh, and I shared some 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 facebook or facebook you know, the amazon is burning ah, the climate is going uh, except that my ecologist friend told me that these forest fires were like regular forest fires in the amazon yeah and even after understood that this was a group signaling a group membership signaling behavior from me that i shared these fake news on my lefty environmentalist side even after that, once I, I accidentally shared it because I sort of forgot because our truth, our collective truth was uh, was uh, was from that. Yeah? So the problem is that when we have these fragmented networks, our our collective truth 
we have separate different collective truths. And I think that is the moment when we, when one of the tricks that we can use is that we say, you know, I am who I am. In fact, uh, so individualism is almost like a, a coping tool for this situation. Except, of course, in each of these subnetworks, you're going to be the, your local who you are uh, in, within that fragmented, fragmented space. So fragmented network equal fragmented personality? Uh, fragmented, at least fragmented strategies of of how you deal with that. Uh, Irena, you you want to I'd lean to that hypothesis, Laurie. Sorry, I think fragmented, very likely. But I'll say it again, Isabel. No, I think that's a really good sort of like hypothesis or good thing to lean into and test about that. Yeah, because I, I know the initial assumption is that okay, you think they have this wide network, which means influence, which means power, but actually. To be able to split yourselves, I mean, there is also that science that you can only have like seven close friends or something. You can't possibly, or there's only a, there's a limit to how many good deep relationships a human can actually sustain. But yeah, I wonder if um, if you if you're a part of all these fragmented networks to be able to operate in those in an authentic way, whether that means you've got a fragmented personality. Interesting. Uh, the the actual the data shows so so uh, this came. Uh, this came from from uh, from some of Robin's Robin Dunbar's work, I and mean, he observed that there are these layers. Uh, actually, unfortunately, uh, uh, these layers layers don't don't repeat. So it seems that in, in general we have sort of uh, the in the, in terms of frequency of contact and and emotional intensity, we have these fairly smooth but declining curves. Uh, but of course, individually, so it means that as, as, as a species, we don't have these layers. Um, but individually, we perceive that that some some number of friends, some number of social connections, is is going to be more comfortable for us than others. But this is purely due to in, institutional variation, and very much to the co due to the cost of maintaining relationships, given the environment. So that's one of the things that I think these. This new the, the, the Dao innovation uh, can deal with is how how to create the systems in which the the cost of of interaction affects the this this idea what people what kind of number of relationships people will end up with. Uh, Irena, you wanted to say something. Yes, thank you. I was drawn to your the to the idea that you mentioned about there there cannot be real cooperation in those sort of uh, relationships. So I was thinking uh, what it came to my mind is where, what, what are the principles that we need essentially to know that it is behavioral cooperation, truly behavioral cooperation, and where in the digital space have you seen it? Right, um, so I would want to know whether a, a re, whether the the cooperation requires either the repeat or that the, there's a there's a there's a repeat going to happen so we will meet again or that there is some shared social connections via whom reputation uh, happens the reputation path happens so, so if i when i sit into an uber in, I don't know, in London or in Santiago de Chile or whatever, uh, we will never meet again. And we probably don't have any shared friends. Um, the only way that, the only reason this works is, is, the, is the number of stars that people give to each other, uh, which in some countries are already broken. Uh, 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 so I would want to know to what extent there's a need for for this kind of uh, repetition. Uh, there was a very interesting um, study. Um, it was, I think, maybe six years ago, something like that. It was a NASA study where they were trying to see to what extent these digital cooperation, online cooperation can, can uh, form. Uh, um, if everybody knows this study, please stop me. Uh, and so they had several uh, hundred uh, four-person teams. Uh, and they wanted to know what uh, people, 
the team had to work together for a collective uh, objective. Um, and, and what they wanted to see is what drives the cooperation in these. And, and there was a very odd thing that in many, in the not so successful groups, there were some shirkers and they ended up the tra tragedy of commons. And there were some groups where, where people, everybody pulled their, their weight and they, they were very successful and they won or were near winning. Uh, but the most important factor that determined whether people are going to shirk on each other or uh, people are going to uh, cooperate with each other was how how far their time zones were from each other. So when they were uh, uh, in the same time zone, then somehow it worked better as opposed to different time zones. So this is very interesting. So that 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 suggests, I think, that that there is this immediacy of of meaningful interaction yeah because because i do something you do something and we constantly observe that we are engaging with the, with the other all the time and then it's also easier to remember because the other one is there uh and then you can you can have this you know the, the cognitive load from of the corporation is lower uh and and then so you end up with these um um, uh, but I think that the key here is that is these 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 new systems I think would benefit from triggering real interaction as opposed to uh, uh, as opposed to uh, and you know there can be okay the best would be if people, if people could eat together it's sort of doable uh, people could sing together. Is it still not doable? Uh, you know, there are you know we are apes who evolved uh, to use our bonding systems to 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 be together, to form a group together. Uh, and uh, yeah, Andrea, you raise your hand. Yeah, fascinating. Um, I'm wondering how markets fit in here, right? Markets, thinking of them as um, anonymous networks where small cooperative groups, people who actually do know each other at some level, then trade often very anonymously. And this is something that has evolved much more recently. You know, it's not the African Plains Ape activity, but it's pretty old. And the, and we have adapted over, what, 50,000 years or something like that to that kind of interaction. And, and I'm curious how, like, what, what have we as humans adapted to that kind of interaction that's different than just this reputation, the personal sub bar kind of, I know this person? Right. So, um, yeah, so do you know um, Athena Actipis' work on need-based versus exchange-based uh, cooperation. So very interesting work. So she originally she works on cancer uh, and and uh, single cell uh, cooperation, and she realized that that there was there were two different kinds of of of, of exchange systems, uh, and then she found these to be present for human societies as well. One was um, uh, the accounting-based uh, uh, system, uh, which was, which is, uh, I give you this and we write up the value, and then you give me later uh, something else and we write up the value, and then they need to be, and at the end of the day, they need to be the same. Of course, at the end of the day, we are all dead. Uh, the the other one is the is the needs-based or demand-based system, in which if you have a lot of apples. And uh, uh, so above a certain threshold, and I have less than a certain threshold of apples, I can go up to say, oh, can I get some of your apples? And and if this only these these two things, uh, two two conditions have to be true. You have above a certain threshold. I have under a cert certain threshold, and then you will give me. And then we don't write it out. <laughs> and and it seems that that this system. Uh, People sort of oscillate uh, these among these exchange systems, um, and and they 
behaviorally they're quite different. Uh, partially because when we are giving something sort of unconditionally, we have an oxytocin release in our brain. So, so we bond with the one with, with, to whom we gave. When we have an exchange, we don't have this kind of bonding. So it's very interesting that how many of, of these situations happen when there are, uh, I and mean, if you can see the financial markets often, that there are all these sharks uh, who will, uh, who are competing with each other, but then they go out and party together. They, uh, in, especially in the olden times before the, the anti-bribery anti regulation came in and uh, stopped these, they, they would regularly go out uh, for a, a weekend uh, together. And then if, you know, if I observe what they're doing, they're bonding with each other. So it's like a very interesting double effect. That they, there's this exchange-based system, but they, at the same time, they want the, 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 the social uh, element, uh, element uh, uh, to it. They want the other kinds of, of bonding. I'm not sure if I'm answering your question. Did I answer your question? Ah, Athena Activis. Uh, Athena, uh, where is this? How do I? I almost never use uh, Google for this. Let me just. Uh, okay. On the on the bottom right, you can find. But it. it's uh, Activis. Activis. Athena Activist. She she has a, a, a recent book on on cancer, which uh, which is fantastic, uh, and she has got uh, she's running uh, she's in Phoenix Arizona, uh, and she's running a, a, a project called the Human Generosity Project, and uh, uh, where she, that's what they they do they're collecting examples for the, these two different kinds of of interaction. And and uh, um, and shifting societies that shift in between two. In fact, I, I know about this because we are trying to pull my theory and my work together with hers. So basically, when super interesting, yeah. So what happens when falling fertility and urbanization and migration rewires the social networks? So we have this need for a different kind of uh, uh, solution to uh, organize our societies, and then at the same time we are shifting from a need-based accounting-based system. And then is there a way to hack this uh, theoretically that, that uh, we are somehow, uh, we, we, we change some elements of the system so that we, we automatically shift to a, a more of a need-based, or at least some communities are need-based rather than the accounting-based system. So I guess this is what uh, uh, the Aaron Dow is also trying to, to, to figure out in practice what is happening here. Donia, yes. Uh, yeah. No, thank you. Super, super, super interesting. And and please keep us updated as this uh, theoretical work continues, because I, I do see a lot of potential for, for cross pollination with what we're doing. I, I want to know you had some references about something in inequality. Institutions addressing inequality. Here. Um, no, not really. You're breaking up. Oh, is it still breaking? Nothing faces. Nothing can hear me. That is breaking. But I know. Okay. It's. Thomas. Hello, I'm here. Okay, so uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's still cracking up. Well, we can't be connected if we don't have internet connection. <laughs> <laughs> we need, I don't wonder what backups we can have. A fire, a fire, and sit around it. Send up a flare. A fi fire, yeah. a fire, a fire. Yeah. Okay. No, that's sure. But then they've got to be in close proximity. Yeah. I do wonder. This is a, a very tangential point, but you know, if we lose internet connection, we electricity blackout. 
what we're gonna do. <laughs> Not everyone lives in the city, yeah, but still interesting. Yeah, so uh, Daria's question is about, about inequality re uh, leveling and how the networks shape uh, it interacts uh, with uh, uh, inequality. So this is a very interesting uh, question because it turns out that when we are using uh, social, when we live in a society that is uh, hierarchical and we use the position in the hierarchy to uh, choose our friends. So the, when we do similarity-based similarity friendship choice to replace the missing families, to increase our custom coefficients, just as good as other markers of, of, uh, of other traits along which we can organize ourselves. Uh, so when we do that, there's a very odd thing happens to, the, to the society, to our social networks, because we sort of end up with these sausage-shaped networks. The top uh, is going to be connected to each other, uh, so it's going to be the elite, and the bottom is going to be connected to each other, and the middle are going to be connected to, to each other. So although people might end up with a, a, a highly or more highly connected uh, social personal networks, as a society, we're going to have a, a, a trouble organizing ourselves because there's going to be a big divide among the the elite networks and middle networks, and the bottom networks. So it seems that that the best kinds of um, social best kind of solutions when we provide people with a bunch of markers of of uh, with which they can signal their their type their traits so that they can choose each other based on similarity which is good for cluster coefficient uh, one of the worst uh, uh, type of marker is is a, a status hierarchy especially that is going to trigger uh, status uh, seeking behavior, especially for men, um, but for women as well. But uh, the male status seeking behavior is much stronger. Uh, and we, we are also, uh, when the society changes, it might trigger uh, continuous status anxiety. I mean, if you wanted to see a, a mass hysteria about status anxiety, just think of what happened uh, January the 6th uh, last year in Washington. Uh, uh, these a lot of the current populist fascist movements are using hooks into these kind of problems. So, uh, so I think this the best way to do this is to create. Uh, well, of course, you can't you can't really create it for society to end up with uh, a multi-dimensional signaling signals that are ideally not going to create any kind of uh, hierarchy themselves and ideally something that we can change yeah so skin color uh, we can't change yeah sexuality we can't change so using these as traits or any kind of usually bodily traits are not particularly good for for a healthy community but you know who likes mozart uh, uh, is it might be better, much better for them unless it's a signal of, of status and of course it's not good anymore uh, i grew up in hungary where it was okay to not uh, to 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 like uh, classical music without it being a signal, and I, now I live in England, but it is not, so it's a, it's a personal trauma. Anyway, uh, so that, that's that's my uh, brief thought on on interaction between class and and uh, uh, inequality and uh, uh, network uh, structure. Uh, by the way, this is going to be one of our big issues in the global society. Uh, so the global society is one of the, as it's emerging, it's emerging is one of the most unequal societies on the planet. Uh, uh, its level is the same as South Africa's, which is the most unequal society right now. Uh, and and uh, uh, every society has major issues in the past that were that unequal. So not only we need to figure out how we are going to organize ourselves or the 7.8 billion turning slowly 9 billion humans uh, into one successful collective action. Well, we also need to figure out how to do that in a way that everybody is happy and in a highly connected network. It's already a trouble and it's not going to be uh, an unequal society. So 
uh, clearly a major, major trouble. Death. Right, we've run out of time. Uh, yeah, thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Thomas, for, for joining us here. It's been fantastic. Uh, really appreciate thank it. Thank you for hope inviting can, me. Yeah, I hope we can continue, continue this. I'll certainly ping you again as we advance with the culture analytics community analytics research project uh, that we are starting. And thank you, everyone, for joining. If you're interested at the bottom of the link I share there, we can continue the conversation on Arendao server. Uh, and Thomas, I don't know if you have any closing words, but otherwise, thank you again for giving us your time. Really appreciate it. Thank you for inviting me. And thanks for the great comments. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye everyone.